Yes. Mm -hmm.
Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church, located here in downtown Ponca City at 210 North 5th Street. My name is Floyd Novotny and I will be serving as your elder. Joining me is Betty Kreger, serving as a lay leader. Arlene Stoffer is presenting the children's moment. Andrew Orr is our choir director. Reverend Lily Freeman will bring today's message. For announcements, this morning, immediately following the 11 o'clock service, we will consider a proposal by the First Christian Church, Ponca City Pastoral Search Committee, in conjunction with the First Christian Church Council and elders, to extend a pastoral call to Reverend Stephen Johnson for the position of senior pastor. We want to thank those who sent in absentee votes. We really appreciate your vote. One more time, for those in-house this morning, after Burton plays the postlude, please stay for the congregational meeting. Thank you. Please stand for the call to worship. Jesus ascended to heaven. He restored us to God. We light our torches with the new seal. Like a welder, he melds a strong seam to bind us together. Set us on our paths with boldness. The ark of the Spirit showers his fireworks and heat spews down, hissing and cascading. Set us on our paths with eagerness. Tongues of fire like shards of light rain down to touch every mind. Set us on our paths with fearlessness. We are not burned, but we are burning, burning to carry light into every dark corner, burning to carry love to the ends of the earth. Let us pray. Lord, you have come to us in fire many times, from the burning bush to tongues of flame upon our heads. Today, just like the followers of old, we await fiery gifts through the Holy Spirit. On our journeys, we can be unsure and hesitant. Keep lifting us up with the will, excitement, and tools to launch us toward your purpose. Show us how the energy of your love can burn through all barriers to understanding, even language and culture. 
Keep it blazing in our hearts and tongues. Bless our efforts to witness that you still walk with us and that the world needs you more than ever. In fire and rain, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, I was waiting for the music, you know. Um, in addition to William, um, let's see. Sarah, you were a public school teacher, so I need you to come up here. And Andrew, I need, I need you to come up here. Jennifer, you feel like coming up and helping us? Okay, come on. Come on. And, and you went to school, so come help me too. Uh, okay, come on. Come on. Well, I can understand that, yeah. Um, okay, come on. Oh, that's all right, that's all right. I'm gonna go ahead and talk. Oh, come on, Gabby. I need some help here. Yeah, this, this, uh, this is called Arlene is not truly prepared for the children's moment, so she's going to pick on everybody else to help her. Okay? Okay, so first, um, I learned a new game. And well, I, you know, it's probably not all that new, but it's, um, you, well, no, I want you to sit over here with that bling on, right here. Can you do that? I can. <laughs> yes, this is the queen of bling right here. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Anybody doesn't know that already? Amen. Okay. <laughs> now, I learned a new game. And I want to I want to play it just for a minute, okay? Did I miss any kiddos that are from um, uh, in public school or any teachers that I didn't see that finished this year? The first thing I want to say is these folks, these teachers, these students, they deserve a round of applause. Because I'm telling you, as a former educator, that's not a year that would be any part of what I would want to do. So congratulations. You guys were awesome. Okay, here's the new game. And I'm, William, I'm going to ask you to help me, okay? Because I think you're, you and I are pretty athletic. We can do this. Jennifer, I'm going to ask you to hold the mic while, Adam, while William and I play. Okay. 
brilliant one. What do you have to do? You gotta air up the balloon. I have to air up the balloon. So, because I know all teachers and students and John, who was a student one time, have enough air to blow up these balloons. So, everybody gets a balloon. Adam, go over there and sit down by your dad. Adam, can you be Adam today? Okay. Adam Adams, that would be good. Oh, dang it. Man down. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, now, when I tell you, I want you to see if you can put some air in these balloons. But, you know, we're going to learn something from these balloons. Teachers, can you learn something from about anything? Well, we're going to hope we can learn something from this today. Okay, are you ready? Okay, first off, you have a balloon. I think it's going to be round when we get it filled up. And then, William, maybe we can play that game and it'll be more fun. But this balloon, it's a nice balloon. Do you like the color? Why is it that color? Anybody know? Oh, you? No, that would be very wrong. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that would be wrong. It would be because it's Pentecost and everybody's supposed to be uh, Pentecosting in red today. And you know, first I need to tell you, when Karen asked me about the children's moment, she said, what are you going to do? And I said, oh, you know, you know, fire and, and stuff. And, and then Kim called the insurance company and they said, no, don't let Arlene do fire. That, no, <laughs> bad choice. And so we're getting, yeah, so we're getting balloons. But anyway, um, William told us a minute ago that in order to play the game we wanted to play, the balloon needed to be filled with air. So, let's see if we can get started. Um, if the balloon is going to fill its purpose, it has to have air in it. So get ready to fill your balloon. Go. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Stop, stop, stop. I have to tell you something. <laughs> you know, the balloon I told you was going to help us learn something about the church. And, you know, today is Pentecost, and that's the day that God sent his Holy Spirit to breathe life into the church so the church would be all that God intended it to be. Okay, go ahead. Oh, wait, 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 sorry. The church was not witnessing and telling people about Jesus, not, not before the Holy Spirit came. But then the Holy Spirit came, and it breathed light in, life into the church, just like you're doing to those balloons. Okay, so, okay. So then everybody in the church started telling everybody about Jesus. So, okay, go ahead. Oh, wait, 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 sorry. Now, I know, I know. Um, it didn't matter, even if they spoke the same language as the other people, because everybody just understood. Whatever the language was, they just, they just understood. Um, so it didn't matter who you were, what class you were, what denomination or what language you spoke, everybody understood because the Holy Spirit was there interpreting. They were advocating. I think we're going to hear that word in a little bit. So, okay, sorry, guys. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, oh, but then what happened? The church became alive, and they began to do things that God had commanded. Okay, go ahead. Okay, as soon as you are satisfied with the size of your balloon, you can tie a knot in it. And I would help you, but I cannot. You want me to help you? Yeah, you did good. Yeah. John, John tied the knot. Woo! Okay, sorry. Okay, so as you saw, we all breathed life into our balloon. And now, William, it can do what we could do earlier. We could play a game with it. We're not going to, though, however, because I would probably hurt myself. Um, but we need the Holy Spirit to fill us up so we can do what God wants us to do. That's pretty cool, isn't it? All right. Let's have a prayer. We thank you, God, for sending your Holy Spirit. We thank you for breathing life into the church just as we breathed life into this balloon. And we thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to all who believe in Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys, for coming up and helping me.
The story of Pentecost and Acts helps us understand how God sees human diversity, one of God's greatest gifts to the world. They are gathered together in one place when suddenly tongues of fire descend from the heavens and people speak in different languages that each person can understand. The day of Pentecost commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and other disciples following the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, and it marks the beginning of the Christian Church's mission to the world. Now hear the word, Acts 2, 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native lang language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the 11, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea who all live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thus ends the reading. Praise be to God.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our heart be pleasing to you, Holy One. Jesus said in John 14, 16, I will pray and the Father will give us another, a counselor. Counselor is translated as comforter. Speaks of one who draws alongside. The same word can be translated as helper and counselor or advocate as it's found in 1 John. Jesus identifies the comforter as the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in Jesus' name, who will teach his disciples all things and remind them of all things that he had taught them. Jesus encourages his disciples in the time of his departure and in the face of persecution when he says, If I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus also tells us that the Comforter comes from the Father and Jesus identifies the Comforter as the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, and He will testify of Jesus. Our text for today teaches us that the Comforter comes as a gift of the Father. The Father sends the Comforter in Jesus' name, and Jesus sends Him and sends the Comforter from the Father. And as the Spirit of Truth, the Comforter proceeds from the Father. You know, in many systems of the world, especially in Jesus' day, People were accustomed to being ruled in a much defined system, kings and kingdoms, servants and slaves. There was a hierarchy, but in the case of God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, there is no hierarchy. Jesus, God and the Holy Spirit, these three work in harmony for the empowering of the church during the time of Jesus' physical absence. And our text for today, which is found in John 15, 26 and 27, and then I'll pick up again at 6, chapter 6, 10, verse 4. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will speak on his own. 
And he will speak not on his own, but will speak wherever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Words of faith for the people of faith. Thanks be to God. Well, you know, we are a pretty comfort-seeking society. All we have to do is turn on the, any type of media, and we find something at, that is to bring s some support and comfort to us. This drive to seek comfort outside of ourselves is brought on by emotions. And for many, we find ourselves being ruled by our emotions. Dr. Mary Lamnia states that emotions motivate us to do something which may involve taking action that will alter a negative mood or reduce stress. In some cases, like fear, we are motivated to defend ourselves. You know, emotions also make us who we are. An emotion may be profound in the sense that it is essential to our physical survival or mental health, or it may be trivial or even can be dysfunctional. An emotion can be socially appropriate or inappropriate. It may even be socially obligatory, feeling remorse after committing a crime or feeling grief at a funeral. Emotions and our expressions make us unique and able to navigate in the world today. And it is our emotions that get our attention and call us to action and for many to partner with others to bring about lasting change. During my early years work with United Way, I was the project director of their early childhood initiative, Success by Six, which then became Smart Start Oklahoma. One of our national trainers, Dr. Bruce Perry, was sponsored by the Bank of Oklahoma to help our state develop more awareness of the importance of the early years of a child's life and to engage key stakeholders to come to the table for the future and, you know, for our workforce. Dr. Perry was the main psychiatrist who is also called, when there are events like Columbine, he is a trauma expert and has seen the worst of the worst. He works with kids that have not had the opportunity to play and learn like normal children, but were raised in places like chicken coops and other horrible situations. So when he is called in, there is much to do, and he gives ideas on specific ways to help rebuild a child and a community, one child at a time. One family who adopted a child with profound traumatic uh, happenings worked extensively with Dr. Perry. They would made great progress and wanted to transition this child to public school. It was a big step, but the parents wanted their child to have the opportunity to be with other children. Dr. Perry agreed, but on one condition. He meet with a classroom of children and help them understand and support their soon-to-be classmate. The children were gathered, and he shared with them they would be getting a new classmate, a boy that had not had the opportunities like they had. He was not ever given a ball to play with, allowed to explore nature, or been able to have friends. His world was very limited, and on most days, he was kept in a cupboard. As a result, he did not get the chance to see others, nor get to learn how to do many things that they knew how to do. He asked if they would be willing to help him learn how to play, to throw a ball, to be a friend. It would help him to come to school if they would do that. And it would be very helpful to the family. And it would give this boy a chance, like other boys and girls, his own age. He had to, you see, engage that empathy in a child, that empathy to get them thinking beyond what they saw. The boy began school, and the children rallied around him. They taught him how to play games. They developed friendships, friends that carried him not only that year, but the rest of his school years. He would become an outstanding baseball player and would go on to college. You know, Dr. Perry, when he presented us this, he never spoke about he always knew what was needed to help a child succeed. He did, however, always talk about the importance of listening closely to what was being said and what was not being said and to engage others to help. His phrase is always, 
that it takes a village to raise a child the village's role was to nurture the potential of all children and their families he also did not tout his own horn or get very prideful about a lot of things many times after his sessions with his older children that he was working with he would go to the gym and shoot hoops with them well one day this janitor asked him if he would see him after the game so after the game dr. Perry sought the janitor out and the janitor said hey you know you need to check with James a little bit more closely and dr. Perry replied that he'd been seeing him regularly and that they had conversations and that he felt like this boy was exactly on track well the janitor shared that the boy had come on many occasions to get advice on how to interact with the other boys that he was having problems to just talk and sometimes to just sit there with him you know when he was working or whatever and recently he was admitted that he was starting to throw his medications out and he was having thoughts of suicide dr. Perry soon realized that the children saw this janitor as their best support system in that school setting and rather than think this man with no formal education in psychology was not worthy to join his team of experts he ensured that the janitor was every at every staff meeting before any plan was ever officially approved with regards to the boys the janitor had the last word though dr. Perry never shared about his work as being led by the Holy Spirit I had no doubt that he listened he listened to something that was bigger than himself and that's what this season is about is listening to the guidance of the Holy Spirit finding our gifts our amazing gifts that sometimes we just have put on the shelf and especially this year we put a lot of things that we normally do on the shelf but we do that because we want to increase the potential of so many of our children well when asked what his vision for the future was dr. Perry's response was we have to recognize as a human race that children are in places where there is no hope our job as human beings is then to take those children and help them to see a future beyond what they're in for we as a society society we are the only hope these children have that is what Jesus was all about he partnered with a team he came to provide hope and to help us to see that we have a future a future as beloved children of God forever that is the way that Jesus worked while he was here on the earth with the disciples that is the way the Living Word works too, to open us up to more than what we saw before that ability to, to see beyond to see more deeply in the moment is due to the comforter the one who is there no matter what the one who intercedes when we do not have words to say or express the, the tears that come the groans of loneliness and uncertainty as humans when something is uncomfortable and feelings are sometimes uncomfortable they pop out when you least expect sometimes even on Sunday mornings when you're here as humans we sometimes don't like to be uncomfortable so we will avoid uncomfortable at any cost and as a result we reach to other things such as addictions with food or alcohol even TV and I've noticed that Facebook can be very addictive oh my goodness um, sometimes I've caught myself wanting to just shift over there and see what everybody else is doing because I don't like what's going on over here but that's avoidance that's avoidance and as dr. Mary Lamney at psychology day states our culture has erroneously taught us that we should find ways to get rid of negative feelings rather than truly experience them in addition there is a prevailing belief that has been that any arousal due to anxiety or stress is harmful and that we should do anything to suppress or decrease it if we have a healthy response to stress we recognize the symptoms we are having in our bodies is our body preparing to meet a challenge when we can refrain from going to immediate comfort of something like addictions or avoidance we can use our emotions to signal that something is just not feeling right right now during the season of Pentecost we have a chance to work with things that are not feeling right right now 
we have a chance to be more available, be more aware of the role of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit can play out in our lives. We can partner with our team of three, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and trust that we will not be led astray. And also, we can be more authentic with each other and more readily available to stand up when we are called to do so. I think a wise pastor stated it best this way. The Holy Spirit takes the gifts of God, which Jesus purchased by his death and resurrection, and applies them to our lives. He takes the message of Jesus and writes it on our hearts. The Holy Spirit's ministry on Jesus' behalf is now available worldwide. So what keeps us from going to the Holy Spirit with all our needs? Why do we pick and choose what we ask of the Spirit to help us with? I am guilty of trying to handle many things on my own when I could. And may this day forward be a reminder that we should always go to God, Jesus, and the Spirit. Our mighty team of challenge bearers that can get us through anything, anything this life brings for us to face. Well, one source that I go to sometimes, especially around the Holy Spirit, is Billy Graham. And early in his Christian faith, Billy Graham began studying about the Holy Spirit as one of the first things he decided he would ask. Why did the Holy Spirit have to come? What his studies led him to learn was that the Holy Spirit came because the Holy Spirit had work to do in the world, in the church, and in the individual. You see, it is the Holy Spirit who shows sinners that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father, our Creator, by Himself. And we also kind of, I think, want to know what we can expect from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a helper who teaches and reminds us of Jesus' teachings. The Holy Spirit provides counsel to Christ's followers. Jesus knew He would be going away and that his followers would need the Holy Spirit as a helper and as an advocate to remind them of his teachings. And even though Jesus would no longer physically be with them, they would have access to him through the Spirit. They were not going to ever have to face any difficulty alone, ever. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes so that we turn from darkness of sin to love, to light, and true life. And the Holy Spirit acts through people of God who are the salt and light of the earth. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Salt and Light, speaks of the influence Christians exercise for good in this society. We see there are so many things that our world is struggling with today. People and animals and even the earth. We may think that there is no hope, yet we are called to be the salt and light for the world. When we partner with the Holy Spirit, we are in step with God. And the world becomes our most enjoyable place because our hearts can more freely communicate God's goodness. And as Jesus pointed out, if his followers were to lose their saltiness, they would no longer be effective at protecting and amplifying God's possessed goodness in the world. In order to amplify the work of Jesus... To add flavor and zest to the world, to bring hope to the hopeless, we need to ask for an extra measure of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because, as Billy Graham states, Christians that work in the world are the only real spiritual lights in the midst of great darkness. Only when the world sees our good works do they know that a light is shining. You know, it would be many years before I would understand as a kid why I would look into people's eyes so intently. It was to see if their light was on. And I know you teachers know what I'm talking about, that light of a child's eyes. They know just by looking whether or not that child is there and eager to learn, have a rough day, or giving up. When we look into a child's eye and give them a smile, 
a nod, a word of encouragement. We are giving them a chance to see there is hope. That is what your service as tutors who have worked at Lincoln Elementary bring to a child. Not only are you helping them to build skills in reading, you are there serving as a beacon of hope. And I also, when I was looking through the work with Billy Graham, stumbled on what he identified as church. And so at this time when we're talking about the Pentecost holiness and, you know, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is always there. But this is a time for us to think more deeply about the movement of the Spirit in our life. He brings up the word church. And he stated that church is not the Presbyterian or the Baptist or the Methodist or the Anglican or the Lutheran or the Pentecostal or Catholic churches, but the whole body of believers. He shared further that the word church comes from the Greek word that means called together ones. For every person who has repented of their sin and received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is a member of this body called the church. The church is more than just a religious organization or this building. It is a living and breathing body of believers with Christ as its living head. The Bible tells us that the church was brought into being by the Holy Spirit. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member but many. The Holy Spirit, therefore, can move us individually, sending us out on different paths and planting us in different places to bring hope, awareness, and healing to those whom we serve. And when I think about holy work, I think about one of my favorite books that, of all time, and that you may be aware of it, it's called Kitchen Table Wisdom by Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen. Uh, she's an amazing lady, uh, went through medical school with Crohn's disease and just had a number of surgeries upon surgeries. But in all of that, it made her a deeper listener to people, uh, patients that had challenges. She has, uh, she's an MD and she's also a clinical professor of family and community medicine at UCSF School of Medicine and the founder and director of the Institute for the Study of Health and Illness at Commonweal. She is one of the pioneers of relationship-centered care in integrative medicine. U.S. News & World Report Best Graduate Schools has called the healer's art, her groundbreaking curriculum for medical students, a profound, innovative curriculum on reintegrating the heart and soul into contemporary medicine and restoring medicine to its integrity as a calling and a work of healing. In her early years, during her internship, she was discovered that she had a very special way of being with her patients. One night, a nurse called and said, we have a young boy who was in the final stages of his battle with leukemia. The nurse said, he, wants, he just keeps wanting to get up and get ready to go home. And she said, he is too ill to be getting up and maybe we should help settle, maybe she could come and help settle him down. So Rachel sits with the young boy, helps him put together all of his little items in his suitcase, and then he sits with him, and then she sits with him until he takes his last breath. She knew that home for him was not this physical home where he lived, but the heavenly home, the place where he would not feel pain and would have a new body. That is the power of the Holy Spirit to know how to listen to someone especially at that time. You know, kids, they don't always explain everything, and we don't always explain everything. So we have to read between the lines, and sometimes we have to have that guidance. And um, so I, I, I admire her work. She's got many stories. If that's a book you haven't added on yourself, please, you know, consider it. She's also written a book called My Grandfather's Blessings. She became, uh, she was a family of doctors going through those stages, and so it's just... Um, common things that we run across that we can shepherd each other through those times. And she also wrote an article recently called Helping, Fixing, and Serving. She states that helping, fixing, and serving are three different ways of seeing life. We can fix a lot of things and we can help with a lot of things, but to really make a difference, it is through our service to others. 
For service is the work of the soul. Working and partnering with the Holy Spirit is soul work. So during this season of Pentecost, our call is to look inward, to do some soul work, find our hope and healing, and then to look outward to care for those near us and elsewhere. You see, the Spirit's work is not to lift Christians out of embodied lives in this world to well and dwell in some ecstatic state but rather to continually transform in human life together with all creation into the fullness of God's intentions. I'd like to end our time today with this words from Pastor Claudio. Pentecost is a call for the church, the gathered people of God, to live in the full power of the Spirit, not in the power of budgets, programs, or consumerism, Rather, it is a call to act upon our inward and outward selves together. May we continue our service as disciples everywhere to partner with the Holy Spirit and help bring hope and healing to as many of our brothers and sisters as we can. Amen. Let us continue our prayer. Almighty and ever-living Creator, on this day we remember you filled the hearts of your faithful with light and joy of the Spirit of the Christ. We know through your life-affirming grace, we too are loved unconditionally. We came to know you are present with us and in us forever. You are our friend and advocate forever. How do we thank you for these holy gifts? How do we thank you for the Jesus Spirit alive in us? Could we be life givers too? With your help, we can do this. Through the teachings of your prophets and apostles, by the building up of community in this church, and by our devotion, we can do this. Lord, our God, inspire us anew, each of us, Devote ourselves to becoming the best disciples we can be. Through your spirit, may we be strengthened this day to bear your light to the world around us, tell your stories, advocate, advocate for justice and healing, be friends to the voiceless, the poor, the broken among us, be partners with one another in this work you have given us. Light our way. Lift us up when we stumble. You have seen us and this community through a recent wilderness. At times the light grew dim, but it was never extinguished. Today it flames anew. As you gave us light, give us now kindred fellowship, love for each other, and support to one another in witness living for you. For the sake of Jesus, to whom all our intercessions are known, and with his spirit, we remember now the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We know the season of Pentecost is celebrated in the Christian faith for the coming of the advocate promised by Christ. The day of Pentecost is also a celebration of God's hand guiding the Christian community through the trials and decisions that are presented to it. Truly, this church has experienced the guiding hand of the advocate through this past year, and it continues today. There is no more appropriate time for us to celebrate the life and promises of Christ than here at this table. So, come to the table has been set, and we have much to celebrate. Let us prepare as we sing a communion hymn.
on the very night that Jesus would be betrayed, the very night that he would be last with his disciples, all of them together. He took the bread, he blessed it, he gave thanks and he broke it and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Eat of it often in remembrance of me. Thank you, Holy One, through the great comforter, advocate, and faithful guide, we become a part of God's holy love. Allow us this day to feast at the, as the family of God at this table, Christ's table of everlasting love. And as we partake of this bread, come upon us, Holy One, and fill us with your empowering strength that we may love more like Jesus. Help us to build a bigger place in our hearts for others. As we eat this bread, we know the great sacrifice you willingly gave for each of us. Allow us, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, to serve as your vessel of love and forgiveness to all our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Body of Christ. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He blessed it and said, This is my blood that is poured out for you. Drink of it often, for as often as you do so, do it in remembrance of me. Lord God, whose Son is the true vine and the source of life, ever giving himself that the world might live, may we so receive within ourselves the power of his death and passion, that in the cup of his life we may share his glory and be made perfect in his love. For he is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Cup of blessing. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we claim Christ's death, celebrate Christ's resurrection, and await Christ's coming again. Pentecost today can be a time when we feel the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives sense a renewing of our purpose and hear the call to serve a hurting world with love and grace. It can be a reminder that God's work continues to be done through ordinary people like you and me. Called and empowered by God's own spirit to do God's work in the world. So let us, as empowered people of God, share the gifts that we have been given by returning a portion of our tithes and offerings. To share your gifts, you may leave them by the door as you leave. If you are watching online, you may send or bring your gifts to the church office or give electronically through Givelify. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we lift up these offerings as a sign of our gratitude for your love and care. We pledge ourselves time, talent, and treasures. We dedicate our lives to you and seek to grow in our faithfulness to your word. Amen.
Forgot my other part. Sorry. You know, sometimes it's you get led by the Spirit, and you just learn there, and it's time for you to get up here and do something. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I don't know how many times I have to do this to get it right, you know, but we're not about getting everything right. We're about getting every, you know, being there and doing and being in the moment. So if you would like and you feel like that you would want to join this church and the tradition we have is that we extend that invitation that you can partner with us. You can make a commitment to follow Christ. You can and rededicate your life or you can just say, I want to be a part of what you all are doing and partner. That's what we're all about. Please stand as we sing our closing hymn, Wind Who Makes All Winds That Blow. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us today, online or in-house. We would ask you that you remain after the postlude for the congregational meeting. If you, need, if you are unable to stay for the meeting, please have a blessed week. Through the Spirit of Jesus Christ and with a flame in your heart, go forth and be the best disciples you can be. Go forth following God's light and be love and light for one another. Go forth and be God's church. Hallelujah. Amen.